Bonjour, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Northern Innovators Showcase. Bienvenue à tous pour uh, une autre session uh, sur le sommet sur la croissance rebâtir sous le thème Rebâtir le Canada, présenté par uh, le Forum des politiques publiques. Aujourd'hui, nous allons uh, avec le focus sur les innovations et innovations dans le Nord. I'm Yolande James, je suis Yolande James, and I'm so happy to be hosting this session again with you this afternoon. I'd like for us to begin with um, a virtual land acknowledgement. As you know, we would normally be hosting this event on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. However, uh, I'd like to ask you to take a moment uh, wherever you are to acknowledge the traditional territory of the indigenous people in your thoughts. We extend our respect to all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples for the valuable past and present contributions to the land that we call Canada. Today, we will hear from presenters joining us from across many territories, and I would invite them if they feel inclined to tell us about the indigenous territories where they find themselves as well. So welcome to the Northern Innovative Showcase again today. Of course, that this is a session that is part of PPF's Rebuild Canada Growth Summit. Though we're gonna do things slightly differently. The good news is we have more time. This will be a 90 minute session. We'll begin by hearing from three incredible innovators from across the North, North as they tell us their stories of creative problem solving. Then we'll bring everybody together for a panel discussion on what innovation means and how Canada can better support and foster innovation across the country. Finally, we'll have the opportunity to hear from you um, and we invite you to really um, submit your questions. You can submit your questions through the chat function on Feedloop. After the sessions end, I, the session ends, I do encourage you to head on over to the virtual exhibit hall to connect directly with today's speakers and several other Northern innovators. This is your unique opportunity to network, to check out some cool content and make connections um, that you might not be able to make in your regular Zoom life. So you can uh, find the exhibit hall on the left hand menu of the feed loop page. Um, before we get started, I would like to thank our partners, the Northern Innovator Showcase. Innovators Showcase is brought to you by the Government of Northwest Territories, the Government of Yukon, the Government of Canada, the Rideau Hall Foundation, and the McConnell Foundation. So uh, let me get right to it and introduce um, our first speaker who will present our, present our first incredible innovator. That is uh, Bill Mintram. He is the Director of Indigenous and Northern Relations with the Rideau Hall Foundation, which has been a great partner on this and several other PPF uh, events. Bill is Mitzi and is a graduate of the University of Saskatchewan. Prior to joining the RHF, he held senior positions with several prominent Canadian nonprofits. Bill joins us today from Ottawa. Over to you, Bill. Tanse. Uh, and I am joining you from the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people in Ottawa. And uh, I was raised in Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. I have the honor of working with the Rideau Hall Foundation, which is built upon four themes of focus that contribute to a stronger Canada, learning, leadership, innovation, and giving. And within these areas, we have a wide range of initiatives that include the upcoming Innovation Week, uh, November 16th to 20th, so, uh, along with supporting many important areas, including Indigenous teacher education and as managing partner for the Arctic Inspiration Prize. And on the topic of the Arctic Inspiration Prize, I am really excited to be joining you today to introduce Lois Phillip, who is one of our Arctic Inspiration Prize laureates, who last year won $1 million towards an initiative called Northern Compass. And uh, Lois is a longtime resident of Fort Providence, Northwest Territories, where she still resides. And uh, she has dedicated her life to improving the well-being of youth in Dacho First Nations region. And uh, she uh, had worked a long time as principal of the school in the area with the elementary and secondary school. And uh, is also the recipient of many awards, including uh, um, Indigenous Education with Inspire, 
Outstanding Principles from the Learning Partnership in 2011, um, Award of Excellence from Northwest Territory Recreation and Parks Association, uh, Northern Youth Abroad Builder Award from Northern Youth Abroad, and so much more. And so I have the uh, honor of, of being able to introduce Lois and the amazing initiatives that she is bringing forward and acting as an innovator across the North and not just in her home community of Fort Providence, but impacting the lives of young people uh, right from Yukon uh, through to Nunavut and uh, really amazing. Uh, this last year I had the honor of uh, meeting her and, and seeing uh, the team that she brought together with a vision for Northern Compass of dramatically increased achievement among Northerners, pursuing their education and career goals after high school, enabling them to become full participants in their communities and beyond. And in recently chatting with Lois, really being able to hear her heart uh, on wanting to see the youth uh, coming forward uh, and being able to allow them to determine what success looks like. And so with that, I would like to introduce Lois. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm speaking to you from my home community of Port Providence in the Northwest Territories. Um, I apologize if the connection is, is not going to be all that great at times. Um, just listening to the introduction, I was able to catch most of it, but not quite all of it. So what I'm about to present is is a story of Northern Compass and, and where it all began. Um, it really was born out of the challenges that um, our youth in transitioning and pursuing their academic and career goals. And a lot of this work came out of an organization, Northern Youth Abroad, um, um, working with youth from both Nunavut and the end of and it was a culmination of, of many years of of working with our youth and, and trying to understand the challenges they faced. Um, and really, it culminated last year in in winning the one million dollar AIP prize last year. That had the tone for a lot of the things that we want to do. So within the Northern Compass team, there were four co-leads: one from the Yukon, one from Nunavut, and one from Southern Canada are, I'm going to see if this works. Yes, so this is our team. Um, this is this is the culmination of a lot of work that we had um, engaged in up to this point. We had third time lucky, so we had applied for the AIP, AIP three times and third time lucky. And really, um, sorry about this, I'm going to go and get the presentation so I can actually follow it on my laptop. And um, part of the challenge here is I'm looking at the small screen and I don't have my talking notes around and other things. So I'm just gonna talk. So the vision was essentially created out of we we were through Northern Youth Abroad, able to connect with our youth in a really meaningful way. Um, and essentially, our youth really became part of the much larger family. And in that story, what we found was, although we were able to support them through their high school career, once they were looking to transition into Southern post-secondary institutions, we found that they came up with a myriad of challenges in terms of just that transitioning into the South. When I moved south to go to university, I went to York and Toronto, and I remember trying to take a bus for the first time. And, you know, I'm a little, I'm a kid from Northern Canada and had never taken a bus. So I'm watching everybody and I'm like, okay, so you, you get on the bus and you put some money in that thing there and then you get to ride. So I did that. And then about half a block later, the bus screeches to a halt because I hadn't put enough money in because I didn't have the confidence to ask what I need, needed to do. And I think that, in essence, sums up some of the challenges our youth face. They, we don't know what they're facing. So the idea around Northern Compass is that we, we are very 
um, solution orientated. We're, we're, we don't live in a box and say this is our program. What we do is we say, okay, these are the challenges that our youth are facing and, and whatever they need in that moment is what we, we look to how to support them. Um, you know, for instance, this past week we had a student that transitioned back into the north from the south. Um, they weren't able to handle post-secondary in terms of the pandemic um, and just not having those supports. And they're in isolation in Yellowknife and we're like, are you, how are you taking care of your mental health? Are you getting out? Are you doing that? And she's like, well, I don't have a winter coat. So immediately that's what was our priority for that youth was making sure that they had a winter coat so they could get out and they could look after mental health. Um, so the project beginnings really are about how do we support our youth in their dreams and aspirations? And one of the things with, with all of our youth is that they are so incredibly um, talented and resilient in so many ways. And they all have dreams and aspirations. And, and it's, our, it's our challenge to support them and to give them everything that they need so that they can be successful in their transition. Um, and essentially what we're trying to do is bridge a gap, whether we have youth that are in Ottawa, whether we have youth that are in Vancouver Island, wherever they are, they all have that, the gaps. They have needs that, that are not recognized in the moment. Um, and, and sometimes it's as simple as saying, you know what, you, you need to go to the tutoring center on campus or whatever, or, you know, if you want to go, um, you know, you need to look after all of your your needs in a way that is supportive and it reaches out and creates community. Um, whether it's in Nanaimo and connecting youth to, there's a housing complex called Salish Lalum, which allows youth and elders to connect together. It's, it's about looking at what is in those communities and helping them access those services in a way that really supports them. Um, and with the support of, of what we're able to do and offer, ultimately what we want to achieve is having our youth understand that to make the North a stronger place, we need them to get an education and we need them to come back in a and, and be the change makers, be the innovators that really will sustain lasting change. I think we're in a really unique time with the pandemic um, and we're really, I think it's really an interesting time to look at those innovative solutions. I think that um, we need to put at the core of everything we do, the idea that our youth are going to inherit what we create and they will move it forward. Um, and at the core of all of education, I remember being at a conference with Senator Murray saying, you know, education has gotten us into this mess. Now education needs to get it out, get get it, us out of this mess. And and at the core of that is creating that our youth can pursue and be successful at. And sometimes it's six, the de definition of success needs to to be malleable so that it meets the needs of our youth. Um, you know, I'll often say to, to youth that I work with, you know, you need to go out and you need to figure out what changes you need to create in your community so that you come back to your community, it is a stronger community. And, and that's a slightly different message in that, you know, I think within schools, it's, yeah, graduate, go out and get your university, college diploma, degree. And there's never any mention of then you need to come back to your community. And I think that's really important. Um, this picture right here was a picture was taken where we took a number of students on a university college tour. Um, in five days, we visited 16 different post-secondary institutions with the idea that once our youth know what's out there, then they can better choose. Um, the natu natural pathways into post-secondary are usually Um, in Nunavut, you know, directly south, but I think we need to expand our scope 
and understand that you know there are many many different opportunities available. Um, this photo right here is pretty interesting. This was at the end of our college tour in Edmonton at the hotel staff training room. It's about 1130 at night and every youth is working diligently on getting through their assignment package. Um, if you hold our youth to expectations, I find that they'll often exceed them. Um, one of the challenges of educating in the north is when you have teachers from away, their understanding of who we are and their understanding of their default values are very different. And we need to hold our, our youth to a high standard. Um, and, and they've said that to me. They've said, you know what, um, one of the challenges of their schools is they're not being held to, to a standard, a high standard um, because of all the other challenges that, that they experience. And this really is about opportunity for them. Um, you know, some of the success factors of Northern Compass are th that really we treat every challenge as an important challenge. Um, and every student is not put through a cookie cutter process, but rather others like what do you need in the, and whether it's connecting with with organizations or whether it's connecting with supports at the post-secondary institution or creating a sense of family. Those are all really important. Um, setting up tutoring and such is what makes us really innovative in the idea that um, really we need to we need to be able be able better to respond to the needs of our youth and, and doing that will allow us to see incredible changes in terms of what our youth are capable of and pursuing. And one of the challenges I'm finding here is that that little screen is so small so I'm just kind of talking off the top of my whatever. So, so the picture here is pretty special to me. That is one of the students that I taught. Um, and through the opportunity, she is now finishing up her degree at Vancouver Island University in Indigenous Studies. That is something that I don't think she ever had in her mind as something she wanted to pursue. But as a young 17-year-old, having graduated, she spent the winter in Costa Rica. She spent the summer, a summer in Australia through the AIM project. So it's about giving our youth the opportunity to go and do those really cool things. Um, I am I'm privileged to be able to work with, with our youth and I, I am privileged to be able to work with an incredible team at Northern Compass um, with the idea that really our youth are at the core of everything we do and there is no challenge too great that we can't um, we can't tackle head on. So I'd like to thank everybody. And this was this was, this was Thank you so much. I see we're doing the virtual clapping or snapping. That was great, Lois. Thank you for really um, uh, laying out all that you do at Northern Compass and the different challenges and action that you're taking to supporting youth and, and their trans transition. I'd like to uh, now call on um, Stephen Mills to introduce our next uh, presenter. Stephen Mills is the Cabinet Secretary and Deputy Minister of the Executive Council Office of the Government of Yukon, which has been an important partner in putting this event together. Mr. Mills is a member of the Wunchuk Ginchin First Nation from Old Crow Yukon and holds a Master's of Environmental Practice from Royal Roads University. Stephen has extensive leadership and management experience with First Nations, the territorial government, and with private enterprises enterprise, and he has been in his current role since February of 2019. Stephen joins us today from Whitehorse. Stephen. Hi, uh, Jim Gweensy, everyone, and uh, and it's a uh, good day. Um, I do want to appreciate the pronunciation uh, with regards to um, uh, my First Nation. It's the uh, Buntuk Witch Inn, but uh, it was a, a very good attempt at that one. Um, I want to acknowledge, first of all, that I'm uh, 
Uh, I'm joining you from Whitehorse. We're in the traditional territories of the Kwanandan First Nation and Taw and Quachin Council. Really happy to be able to introduce Scott, but I do want to talk to you a little bit about the good things we're doing in the Yukon. Um, I'd like to thank the Public Policy Forum for providing us the opportunity to showcase Yukon talent. Uh, as a remote Northern Territory with a small population, um, I think we Yukon could be underestimated when it comes to innovation um, and disruption. Uh, we have strong, connected community of innovators and entrepreneurs. They're creative, they're tenacious, and they are uh, making terrific advances. Uh, uh, Yukon government, we collaborate with businesses, First Nations, uh, industry, um, in, um, in Yukon's technology ecosystem to make strategic investments and promote entrepreneurial culture. Um, these ongoing efforts, I would say, were recognized last year when the Canadian Federation of Independent Business ranked Whitehorse as the best place to start and grow a business in Canada. Uh, to encourage innovation, our uh, government supports annual Inno Yukon Innovation Prize. Um, we also, um, um, in, um, we also through this prize, try to inspire others with a new theme that we identify each year. Um, I think innovative solutions to economic, social, and sustainable challenges enable us to advance, I mean, explore new markets and opportunities and make positive impacts on Yukoners' quality of life. Um, another one, and uh, you may be able to see uh, at times some people here, but you'll see when he presents, uh, Scott does, is uh, we uh, have worked with others and made a, a, a good, an investment into the uh, Northlight Innovation uh, Centre. Um, Two years ago, we uh, collaborated with the government of Canada and we um, announced that opening of that, this innovation hub and it's the first of its kind north of 60. Uh, the facility brings numerous supports and equipment together under one roof. It helps Yukon entrepreneurs access and help the inspiration that they need. Uh, we also uh, have a 12 week uh, early stage uh, program called uh, Startup Bootcamp and it's just one example of the dynamic programming offered. Uh, we also work with Yukon First Nation corporations, and uh, uh, we committed two million along to in order to allow First Nations to uh, invest five million in Panache Ventures, which is a national venture capital fund. So we have some uh, in, in interesting startups that are moving from product development to commercialization. Um, but I, the one that we want to talk about today, and I'm so glad he can be here, is uh, Scott Kesey, who's one of the co-founders and the CEO of Disco Velo. Um, Scott lives uh, with his wife Jenny and two children in Yukon, and he and the rest of his team have varied, uh, varied backgrounds from environmental consulting, healthcare, education, and occupational ther therapy. Uh, Disco Velo is also a former Northlight Innovation Startup Boot Camp graduate, um, so it does work. Um, we are proud to have them to be one of Yukon's bright lights. Uh, the Northland Innovation uh, provided the opportunity for Scott and other founders to meet, collaborate, unite around a common passion to promote and support emotional regulation and learning. And Disco Velo, uh, the company, was developed to help educators improve the physical and emotional fitness of students and their learning environments. Uh, this is achieved by harnessing the benefits and effects of exercise to promote learning using a stationary bike and digital media in classrooms and in home learning environments. So um, Scott will be able to give you a lot more good information on this. So I'll hand it over to Scott, uh, who can give you more details on maybe the Northlight Center, but especially on the company Disco Velo. So thank you very much for the opportunity to introduce him. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks so much for that great introduction and for the land acknowledgement. Um, yeah, as, as Stephen said, we are really a product of of this place. And so what I wanted to do today was to uh, give you a tour of Northlight Innovation. Um, I'm speaking you today, to you today from Northlight Innovation Center. So Stephen talked about the Yukon government's commitment to supporting innovation and entrepreneurship. And that's really manifested in this incredible state-of-the-art space here in Whitehorse. So I'm going to tour you around a little bit, but I also want to introduce you to a few of the people who are running some of the amazing programming here. Um, as Stephen mentioned, I'm a, I'm a Yukoner. I've been here for 17 years. My wife and I have raised our family here. And after 14 years in the mining and uh, consulting industry, I found myself dreaming of a different path and something that involved creating impact and innovation. And so uh, Northlight Center is the home of the Yukon Struck Society. 
And they have a mission to ignite doers and dreamers through shared space, through knowledge, and through resources. So I became a member of this space, and, and I found that spark that I was looking for right away. And I'll tell you a little bit more of that story later. But um, our company is a direct beneficiary of uh, this place and the intention and the people behind it. And one of those key people is William Lechuga. So I'd like William to introduce himself here and talk a little bit about uh, UConstruct's mission. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Scott, and uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, um, uh, my name is William Lechuga. I am Director of Ideation and uh, Business Acceleration here with UConstruct. Uh, UConstruct Society uh, is started as a grassroots uh, organization uh, with a number of people coming together and thinking that um, we could do better, uh, collaborating, building together. And, uh, and we currently uh, moved about close to two years ago, we moved to a very large space uh, with uh, where we host a, a co-working uh, area uh, for people to share uh, resources. We have a, uh, a make space as well with, uh, with countless equipment, uh, a wood shop, a metal shop, 3D printers and scanners and, and a number of software that is available for, for everyone to, to use. Um, and, uh, and in addition to that, our mission is to also help entrepreneurs, so both SMEs and startups, uh, start here in the north and grow and stay here in the north. Um, and uh, and we, uh, to support them, we run two um, programs uh, year round. One is the Pathfinding Services, which is it's almost like a business advisory service that is available to anyone, uh, anybody in the Yukon. Um, and uh, and the second is uh, is a startup bootcamp that uh, that Scott uh, was alluding to, and in in that program we runs twice a year. Uh, it's a twelve week program, very intense, um, where uh, we're supported by great mentors, who are people who reside here in Yukon, that bring in their expertise, their volunteers, uh, they want to give back, uh, and they want to see us grow. So. I uh, I uh, I take the credit for what it's worth. I think a lot of it is uh, a lot of it is him and, uh, and his passion uh, and uh, his determination to succeed and to build again something here uh, in the north. Uh, and uh, again, thanks for having me and and, and excited to uh, you know for 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 him and and uh, and for all of our companies that are uh, that are growing uh, that are alumni and and uh, that amount to 25 by the end of this year. So, thank you. Thanks so much, William. Um, yeah, our company's idea was sparked right here through a discussion in this co-working space that we're gonna walk through in a second. Um, and UConstruct's programming provided us with the fuel to feed that spark, to organize ourselves and to help get us off the ground. That's our launch, really. And so you can learn more about UConstruct I don't know if it's over here or it's over there in the exhibit hall uh, to the side. So uh, follow along, but UConstruct has uh, has information and connection opportunities there. So this is the interesting part here. We're gonna we're gonna travel. Um, we're gonna go on a, on just a little bit of a tour um, through the co-working space. So we're gonna do this relatively quietly. Uh, we don't want to disturb all the people who are doing great work here. So we've been relatively lucky here in Yukon with. Uh, relatively low case load for for COVID. So in the summer, uh, the Northlight Innovation Center was able to open back up with, uh, with social distancing restrictions. So we're fortunate to be able to be back in this space uh, with those precautions in place. So um, what can I say here? We, the other primary tenant in Northlight is um, Yukon University's Innovation and Entrepreneurship Team. Uh, so their mission is to support business from concept to commercialization, and we're grant. <laughs> I'm Jason here. We're grant recipients of uh, from their funding innovation program. I'm going to set this up so that we can see. Hi, folks. And they also administer the Yukon Innovation Prize, which we were uh, recipients of last year. So I'd like to introduce you to Lauren Manikin Bay. Um, and she is, well, you can introduce yourself and your title and tell the folks what you do here. Thank you. This is such a cool opportunity. What's up, Canada? Um, my name is Lauren Manikin Bay. I'm part of, as I was just introduced, part of the Innovation Entrepreneurship Team. We have been um, at a, a university level working on tech transfer and funding innovative ideas from the original idea all the way through commercialization for 11 years now. 
um, and partnering in particular. I mean, we were able to do this work because of the government of Yukon and Kanor and IRAP. Um, we are also the Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub for the North with nine other incredible hubs, thanks to Ryerson University and the Diversity Institute and Mary Ng. Um, Incubate North is a brand new program that we are launching. Folks will come in the doors in January, the first regional incubator in Canada, um, supporting business development and growth here locally. Um, the BBA, we have a bachelor's in business administration at the university and we're working toward um, engaging students in this incredible place that you're learning about as far as Northlight Innovation, which has been an incredible opportunity to, to, to grow from university down future uh, innovators uh, and the magical pieces that you show up in this space. We figure out what you need and then we are crossing the nation in relation to giving people supports to again bring their idea from idea all the way to commercialization. So we are having a ball here. We're super proud of Scott. This is an amazing opportunity to speak to you all and um, we think you should all move to the Yukon because you can't get cooler than this. <laughs> Thanks Lauren. It is relatively cool out there today. She's right about that. We're going to travel one last time so I can take up my station and uh, give, tell you a little bit more about Discovello as a company. So I'm going to move into a space that is uh, set up to be uh, the first business incubator north of 60. And that'll be my home for the rest of the few minutes I have left here. Um, I think we should be just about ready to queue up my presentation. Just going to make sure I can move my way through it here. <clears throat> yeah, there we are. So bear with me one here. So Discovello. Discovello is a social enterprise startup. We incorporated just over a year ago, so we're early stage. And our founding team is united by a passion for change making and for improving physical and mental health. So we all know a child who's struggling in school with physical energy or emotional challenges. And there's a good chance we know someone who isn't able to fulfill their potential at work because of stress and anxiety. While the science is clear that physical activity is the most effective way of overcoming these challenges and regulating emotional energy. So we're developing software. It's interactive digital media that will engage us, inspire us, and encourage us to move and exercise. And in the process, it will teach us about the brain-body connection and how to use it in all facets of our lives. So what's the problem we're helping to solve? Well, it starts with inactivity, stress, and energy imbalance at the root. And in classrooms, that presents a barrier to learning and it causes educator burnout and ultimately impacts learning outcomes. Those students grow up to be employees and in workplaces, that same stress causes anxiety, which reduces productivity to the tune of a trillion dollars globally last year. So for us, movement is the solution. So the research is clear that getting your heart rate up is the best way to reset your brain circuitry. It improves focus and cognitive functions pretty much across the board. So the brain science supports this and our team includes experts in this area. But one key challenge is overcoming the barriers to exercising. So our solution here is software that encourages users to exercise, connecting digitally with exercise equipment like stationary bikes. So we have a partnership with an organization called Run for Life that has a fleet of 7,000 bikes in Canadian classrooms. And we plan to amplify that power of the simple tool of the bike by connecting that movement with creative content in a gamified, fun user experience. The software collects key data, allowing users to see progress and managers to see value in their investment. So we start in classrooms, but we have plans to expand into a variety of markets and user groups. We have some incredible partnerships which have been really key to our early development. We have academic partners in product development, discipline experts in data privacy and brain science, and innovation partners supporting our business launch and growth. 
I'm going to share a really short video with you now just to kind of close things out that gives you a glimpse of our product development and how all these dots are connected. We could roll that film. DiscoVelo is a social purpose startup on a mission to help users regulate their emotional and physical energy through exercise, starting in the classroom. Together with our partners, we are leveraging the power of interactive digital media in our proof of concept game and data collection platform. Building on the success of a classroom spin bike program, our interface raises awareness of the connection between emotional and physical states. In the gameplay, users explore six different environments where the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals feature prominently, while biofeedback sensors keep the exercise level up. Users are kept engaged in the experience using the principles of gamification and customization. Teachers are able to track key metrics and usage data through a dynamic web dashboard. This proof of concept game is the first of many that will cater to different users and applications in education and therapy, in workplaces and at home. Wherever the forces of stress and anxiety impact our ability to achieve, Disco Velo can help. Learn more by clicking here to help us make an impact today. Well, that's hot off the press. We just kind of finished that up last night, but um, we're, uh, we're pretty proud of that little montage and the product that we're almost done developing. So in terms of our company development, we're still pre-revenue. Uh, we're focusing on development of a minimum viable product right now. You got some glimpses of that game and data uh, flow interactive product there. Um, we'll, we're going to be releasing that for pilot studies in classrooms within the month here in Yukon. We're continuing to validate our customer base and those assumptions and to refine our understanding of our markets. Uh, we're really fortunate to have phenomenal support from Yukon Government's Economic Development Department through a variety of initiatives, uh, most of them here through Northlight Innovation. Um, there's a number of other innovative companies here that we're kind of following in the, in the footsteps of. Proof is digitizing government approvals. Uh, Apprendo is uh, building building successful communities by helping audiences understand their um, or organizations understand their audiences. Um, and there's some great social enterprises here too. It's not all just tech innovation. Um, we have an incredible group of mentors across a wide range of relevant disciplines who are helping us navigate the launch and the growth of our company. Those networks are really critical to success and the innovation ecosystem here in Yukon really understands that, particularly in the context of a remote jurisdiction and networking um, within Yukon and outside partners is really critical to our success. So thanks very much, everybody. We've um, I'm super excited to be here and really, really interested and looking forward to talking with the rest of the panel today. Mm. And we look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Scott. And, and we're so uh, privileged to have been the ones to benefit of the premiere of that video and your virtual tour and meeting the members of your team. Um, your great ambassadors for the Yukon, thank you so much um, for that presentation. So I'd like to call on next on uh, Kyla Kakwi Scott um, to introduce our next presenter. Uh, Kyla is the Director of Indigenous Health and Community Wellness with the Government of the Northwest Territories, another one of the partners uh, who've made today's event possible. So we're very grateful, thank you. Kyla is a member of the Kasho Gotine First Nation and holds a, a Master of Public Administration from Dalhousie University. She first joined the government of the Northwest Territories in 2013, spending three years as Senior Advisor to the Deputy Minister of Health and Social Ser Services, and she joins us today from Yelena. Hi, Kyla. Uh, you're on mute. Hi. Can yeah. Great. Okay. All right, well, hi everyone. Um, as introduced, I'm Kyla uh, Kasha Gutina, originally from Fort Good Hope, Northwest Territories, uh, but I'm joining you today from my home in Yellowknife, which is the traditional territory of the Yellowknife's Dene First Nation, which they call Chief Draghi's Territory. I'm so pleased to be here today to introduce Dr. Candace Liss. 
Candice is the co-founder and executive director of Foxy and Smash, which are peer-led trauma-informed arts-based sexual and mental health programs that use the arts to facilitate discussion, education, and healing among Northern and Indigenous youth. Um, as was mentioned, I work with the Government of Northwest Territories in the Indigenous Health and Community Wellness Division. And our work is really grounded in uh, principles of public participation and community development and focused on community health priorities. We do a lot of that work in partnership with local organizations, and we've been really fortunate to have the chance to work with Foxy and Smash on projects big and small over the years. Um, it really, the relationships and the trust that they have built over the years with youth in this territory are incredibly powerful. In 2014, uh, Foxy was the first organization uh, to be awarded the entire $1 million Arctic Inspiration Prize. They were actually nominated for that prize by the NWT's Minister of Health and Social Services of the day. Um, and I, as a member of the selection committee for the Arctic Inspiration Prize at the time, was uh, able to be a part of that awards ceremony and to present them with their, their giant a million dollar check, which was a great personal honor for me and um, and a huge moment, I think, for for uh, not just for for Foxy Smash, but for the territory, really, and for the North to see that uh, kind of recognition uh, and and the power behind uh, a really um, youth led and grassroots organization. Candace has a PhD in uh, public health science. She's a community based sexual and mental health researcher. And I remember talking to her 10 years ago now, while she was still working on that PhD, about her idea for a youth sexual health project that would include art and interactive workshops. Um, and I sort of like, that sounds cool. I don't know if I entirely get it. Um, it's been incredibly inspiring to watch her turn that idea into such an innovative program and to grow it over the years to include youth of all genders and to start offering programming across the entire North, not just the Northwest Territories. I have no doubt that you will find it inspiring as well. And I'm, I'm really glad that you'll get to hear more about it. Uh, Candace grew up here in the NWT. She's part of a very large Métis family um, and was raised in Fort Smith, but now she lives in Yellowknife. Uh, so without any further delay, I will introduce you to my friend and neighbor and hand it over to Candace to tell you more about her work. Hi, everyone. Um, so, uh, Kyla, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, it was very thorough <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so I am the co-founder and executive director of an organ a nonprofit organization here in Yellowknife um, called Foxy. I'm also the first Ashoka Fellow from the Northwest Territories. And for those who don't know or haven't heard, um, Ashoka is a social innovation and entre entrepreneurship organization that supports a, a network of 3,500 fellows across 92 countries. Um, so it was really excited to be the uh, first from the Northwest Territories. Um, so just to give you a little bit of information about the, um, the Northern context here. Um, so we now offer programming across the three territories, um, which is a massive scale. Um, it involves a huge amount of logistics um, in, in travel across the North. Um, to give you an idea of the scale of the North, um, the NWT alone has a population of about 41,000 people um, spread across 1.3 million square kilometers, which is about 20% greater than the size of Ontario. Um, half our population here in the NWT are Indigenous, um, as are 85% of the folks in Nunavut and 25% of the Yukon. Um, the North also has one of the youngest populations in Canada. Uh, so we have many challenges up here in the North. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into all of them, but I'll just briefly touch on. Um, the idea that uh, youth rates of STIs in the north in the NWT and Nunavut are, you know, between 10 and 15 times the national average. Um, and we have a lot of challenges in terms of mental health. Um, however, any of these social and health disparities that youth face in the north um, must obviously be contextualized within a history of residential schools 
and larger context of income di disparities and limited social and health resources in, Canadian, in Canada's north. So, um, you know, we really need to, to focus on um, the, the structure here in the north. Um, but despite these concerns about sexual and mental health, um, to date there has been a scarcity of culturally age and gender tailored uh, sexual and mental health programming that is by and for Northern and Indigenous youth up here. So that's where, um, that's where Foxy comes in. So we offer uh, two main programs. Uh, the first is Foxy, which stands for Fostering Open Expression Among Youth. Uh, it was launched in 2012, so we're coming up on almost nine years, as a small participatory action research project in the NWT that was um, part of my PhD research. Um, it, the, the PhD was a long, uh, a long journey. I can tell you if you want to um, have a very long PhD, you should do an intervention. Um, but it was, for me, it was, it was really important to do something more than um, writing a dissertation that was going to sit on a shelf. So uh, it took me eight years to finish the PhD, um, but I'm really proud um, that Foxy was developed by and for Northerners um, and, and Northern youth, um, including myself when I was a lot younger. Uh, so Foxy has since grown into an incorporated nonprofit organization we focus on health promotion, healing from trauma, and developing leadership capacity. And we've reached over 6,000 Indigenous and Northern youth of all genders in more than 35 communities across the NWT, Nunavut, and Yukon. And we've trained an additional 475 peer leaders in comprehensive and sexual and mental health education. So the ultimate goal of Foxy and Smash is uh, a stronger connection with the self, with others and the community, including uh, the land. So we offer both nine day on the land retreats that are held usually at Blatchford Lake Lodge in the NWT, which is a 20 minute float plane ride from Yellowknife and uh, gloriously has no access to uh, internet or cell phone coverage. Um, and there we train young folks to be peer leaders and to co-facilitate our programming with adult mentors um, under the, the guidance of Northern elders. So while at the retreat, they develop community projects um, that they then execute in their home communities when they go home uh, with the support of Foxy staff. So our programming uses an arts-based approach to reach youth um, and address sexual and mental health, trauma, sexuality, um, healthy relationships, and to teach coping, coping skills and to engage inner resiliency among youth. Um, we very broadly define the arts. So that can include everything from uh, drama, photography, digital storytelling, traditional beading. Um, the young woman in the picture here is uh, sewing a rattle um, out of raw uh, rawhide. Um, we also do uh, Inuit and Dede games, painting, music, uh, dance, yoga, rattle making, uh, body mapping, all kinds of arts, um, everything you can possibly think of. Um, and we find that the arts are really accessible. Um, youth can engage with them without considering themselves an artist, um, though we also invite those who do invite, who do consider themselves artists. Um, they allow for uh, bringing in cultural cult culture and mitigate barriers of low literacy um, that can sometimes be an issue for some folks. So this combination enables Foxy to address sensitive, taboo, and complex subjects um, through an easily accessible platform with the arts. Um, for instance, we often engage in um, sometimes difficult conversations about things like sexuality or privilege or racism um, while youth are, you know, sitting around sitting around a campfire beating. So um, the arts are a really great way for um, young folks to connect with themselves and with others um, and their communities. So we also have uh, SMASH and SMASH is a program that stands for Strength, Masculinities and Sexual Health. So this was developed in 2016 um, after we earned the Arctic Inspiration Prize and it was done through extensive community and youth consultation. 
So we held interviews and focus groups with over 200 youth, um, men, educators, RCMP officers, social workers, healthcare providers, um, elders, everyone we could think of. We would go into communities and say who should we talk to here in the communities. And uh, so we so we gathered all this information about what folks wanted to see in this program. And then we held from there, we held a two day think tank with an additional 25 male identifying participants um, to develop the, the goals and the focus and the content and even the name uh, for our program. So interactive, uh, strengths based, culturally and contextually grounded and peer led intervention. Um, that's you know focused on trauma informed practice. So all of our programming is co-facilitated between young folks and um, adult mentors um, under the guidance of our, of our elders. Uh, so like Foxy, we offer both school-based workshops across the three territories and also our peer leader retreats. So just a few pictures of what goes on at the retreats. We spend a lot of time outside, a lot of time on the land. Um, connection with the land is uh, really important for us. And um, while at the retreats, young folks are supported to plan community projects. And the idea behind our community projects is to for young people to learn um, that everybody can be a change maker. So no matter what, um, you know, whatever, what, no matter what their needs are that they see in their community, they can make a difference towards changing um, their community for the better. So through our, um, through the active participation in the peer leader retreat, you earn two high school credits. They get an additional two high school credits for completing their community projects. Um, our leadership model also encourages many youth um, to come back to the retreat as apprentices supporting our facilitators. So they earn an additional credit there. And then for the youth who become uh, staff members and peer facilitators on our staff team, they earn another five credits. So they can actually earn 10 of their 100 high school credits um, just for being part of Foxy and Smash. Um, so we're a research and evaluation focused organization. Um, we, we really feel that evaluation is critical for showing our impact and for ensuring that we remain relevant and useful. So we engage in both qualitative and quantitative research, and we use indigenous and participatory methodologies, such as two-eyed seeing and community-based research. Um, just briefly, our findings show that uh, Foxy workshop participants um, show, you know, increased knowledge, safer sex self-efficacy, which is the belief that um, one can engage in safer sex behaviors such as using condoms and resilience. And in SMASH participants, we see things like increased knowledge, developing leadership skills and capacity, um, increased communication skills, um, increased connection with Indigenous history and cultures, personal growth, and also um, redefining notions of masculinity in ways that challenge traditional norms of strength, um, emotional openness, empathy, um, attitudes towards mistakes, and healthy relationships. Um, so I could talk all day about Foxy and Smash, um, but if you'd like to hear more, please feel free to reach out. And there's also all of our social media um, that I encourage you to connect with. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure that you have a production. We'll want to hear more from you as we um, go into the um, um, question and answer um, uh, period. I'm going to loop in right away um, uh, Rosalind May, who is going to moderate the discussion with um, our innovators. Rosalind May is the CEO of the Indigenous Reconciliation Group, a company created to support capacity in organizations to increase cultural competence in their employees and to facilitate frontline delivery to Indigenous clients. Rose was the founding international chair of the Faryi Rata Group based in New Zealand, an international network of Indigenous leaders leading on cultural competence in mental health and addictions. You can read more about Rose's perspective in her regular col column uh, with the Hill Times. Rose is Two-Spirit from Taku uh, River Plinket, First Nation in Northern British Columbia, and she joins us today from Ottawa. 
Over to you, Rose. Thank you so much, Yolanda. Thank you to the Public Policy Forum, but really my, I hold my hands up to our panelists today. I was struck by so much of the work that you're doing is connected to your communities and connected to land. I heard every one of you make reference to the importance of where you're from, your community, where you are now. And I wonder if that is a unique Northern thing, or I wonder if this is what innovators do. So I've been an entrepreneur for four years and all I've learned is it's all learning. And I'm so looking forward to hearing more from our panelists. I'm gonna lead you through a couple of questions. Audience, please feel free to enter in some questions in the chat function you see in your screen. As we, if we have time, we'll certainly get to as many as we can. But let me start off with the first question around this concept of innovation. And I'm going to ask each of the panelists just to maybe take a minute just to think through what innovation means to you. When you started down this path, did you see yourself with an, as the innovator, like the title of innovator? And let me just start with that. Um, so Lois, if it's okay with you, I'm going to turn to you first and ask you, when you started down this path, did you see yourself as an innovator? Lois, what, what, what would you answer for that? No, I no, I did not see myself as an innovator. I saw myself as somebody who had the capacity to to work towards change. Um, I am a 60 scoop survivor, so I grew up in an indigenous community and a non-indigenous family. So I was able to navigate both worlds with a little more ease than others, and felt that I needed to be a voice for my community. And through there. Have been able to take advantage of a whole number of opportunities that, that have presented themselves and, and, and perhaps that's where the innovation comes in is it's being able to take advantage of those opportunities that present themselves in a way that looks for systemic change thank you lois i i thank you for also sharing around a little bit of your background and how it your values shape how you see how you lead change. I, I really appreciate that. Scott, if I can turn to you next, uh, what when you started on this journey, did you did you see yourself as an innovator? Uh, Scott, what do you think? No, I certainly didn't. Um, similar to to Lois's story, I, I I did not see myself as an innovator. I was a dreamer, really. Mm -hmm. I was I was daydreaming at my job about doing doing something bigger with a bigger impact, and what I was was lucky enough to fall into is a, a co-founding relationship with with an individual who is a the epitome of of an innovative thinker. Uh, my partner John Carson has been um, has been innovating in the social sector for decades, and this was just his latest fantastic idea to build on the success of a program he had already. So I've been learning so much from him. And Rose, you talked off the off the top about how important learning is. Every day is learning, and uh, I'm a lifelong learner. And this is 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 an incredible, uh, I guess, excursion in my professional journey to be able to uh, to be a part of this environment and to really start to only start to understand innovative thinking and, and innovation. So no, it's a very new pursuit for me. When I look back at my previous uh, career and job, I, I I realize now that I think I was um, you know doing some some innovative work in uh, in managing teams and in communicating, but on a relatively small local scale. Uh, but there were certainly some missed opportunities for bigger innovation now that I have a better idea of what it is. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate you mentioned, and I, I was looking at your website for your company and just the number of mentors that you've leaned on. And I'm, I'm thinking that would have been an interesting question also to talk about the mentorship that we that you may have received. Candace, can I turn to you? When you started on this journey, did you see yourself as an innovator? Um, I, I definitely did not see myself as an innovator. Um, I think the language of innovation, um, sometimes as an Indigenous Northerner feels really inaccessible to us in the North. Um, and one of the, the biggest, uh, 
things, the biggest hurdles that I had to get over um, when Ashoka kind of reached out to me and said, you know, we're interested in having you be a fellow, um, is learning that entire library of language about in innovation that I had just never considered before. Um, and and one of the um, kind of turning points for me in seeing myself as an innovator was sitting down with one of my elders, um, Jane Dragon out of Fort Smith, who um, said, you know, you, you're participating um, as an Indigenous person in this, this other world of, you know, earning a PhD and, and doing all these things in the South, um, but you need to own that. You need to recognize that, um, you know, you're the first um, female, um, graduate of your high school in Fort Smith to ever go on and earn a PhD who's Indigenous. So she said, it's important for you to um, really own the, that kind of language um, so that young people can see themselves being, um, being like you. So for me, that was kind of like a turning point where I just had to own it and, um, you know, take that on for, for my community. Um, but it, it was quite a process to, to be part of that innovation world. Thank you for sharing, Candice. I, I, was, I was struck by when your earlier presentation around that your work is trauma-informed. And from all of you, I'm hearing very much a, a, a value about connecting and serving community. And you might define it differently depending on the work that you're doing. But I, I'm so struck by your community-centered approach. And I wanted to move into the next question and talk, ask each one of you a little bit around what role has your community played to, to support the work that you've done? Um, and maybe maybe land, if land has also played a, a significant part, that'd be great to hear too. So I'm gonna to turn to each one of you and ask you, uh, what role has community and land played for you as in the work that you do. And Lois, would it be okay if I turn to you first to ask you about land and community? Sure, I missed the first part of that sentence or that question. Sorry about that, Lois. I was asking what role has community and perhaps land played in the work that you've done thus far? Has it been supportive for you? Have you drawn on it? Has it given you strength? Has it given you support and direction? Land and community has informed everything that I do, really. Um, having worked in the school here for 20 plus years, number as principal, I don't quite know how many. Um, I've never been one to count. It's getting our youth out on the land was, was really, really important so that um, when I left the school, our, our students were out on the land for anywhere up to six to eight weeks every year. And that really was important in terms of grounding them into who they are as Dene. Um, and once from there, having a good, better sense of self and community, being able to look outward to say, okay, what are, what, what is it that you really want to do? And what is it that is really important for you? Um, so yeah, land and community has been everything. And, you know, when at university I took a fourth year, fourth world politic course, politics and they they said that you know we all have that one place on this earth that when we're on it we know that that's where we've come from and having been privileged to work in the school system up here it's true it's it's that ability to ground and connect yourself um to really what's important in the moment that that i think has informed a lot of the work that i have been able to do and will continue to do hmm. Thank you, Lois. I, I hear you referencing almost a bit around that balance about leading change and, and still finding that sense of balance from community and land. So I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Scott, um, do, would you have any thoughts around how how is community and potentially land supported or, or helped you in, in the growth into the leader that you are now? I could talk about this, these two topics all day. This is uh, something near and dear to my heart, as, as I can tell it is for everyone else on the panel. Um, and I think that's a key part of, of being in the North. I'm a transplanted Southerner, but I grew up in Northern Saskatchewan. Um, and, and Yukon for 17 years now, I've lived here longer than anywhere else. And it feels like home more than anywhere else, partly because of the connection I feel to the land. Um, so our, our company, uh, our mission is to 
help improve physical and mental health of, uh, of a wide range of users. And we can't very well develop and deliver that uh, by compromising our own physical and mental health. And so one of the things that is really important to our team is, is maintaining, maintaining that fitness and making that a priority. And being out on the land for us, if it's fishing or hunting or exercising or just, just being out is critical to, to my mental health. And, and I'm the same with all, we're the same across our, our partners. And so that, that's our go-to when, uh, when things get challenging. We're, most of us are still working day jobs. And so, you know, this is something that we do well into the evening. I'm sure everyone else can relate. Um, and the strength of community around us, if it's our family and friends, um, you know, we're, we're remote and we live a long ways away from the rest of our family. And it's really important to have that strong community and the community of business support here as well that I've talked about in, in this place uh, is incredibly strong. And I, I have no doubt that we wouldn't be where we are today. We're still just getting going, but without the strength of community and, um, and the importance of place and land. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Scott. And I'm thinking about in this era of COVID, how much more difficult it has been to find that level of support that we, as entrepreneurs, as, as innovators, we kind of, well, as I speak for myself, I lean on the energy of others and we build up those great conversations. And Scott, I remember a few great conversations, in that midnight coffee place. I miss that place in Whitehorse. But Candace, I want to also turn to you. Um, you did mention around the importance of community, and I'm wondering if you want to just touch on a little bit also, how much has community and land played in the development and support of what you've achieved thus far and, and who you are in a leader in innovation? Um, like the other uh, panelists, land and community have, have been truly, um, it's been critical for me. Um, like Lois was talking about, the importance of Northerners returning back home again after they um, received their education. I always knew that for me coming back home again, um, and I'm not quite back home, um, but I'm pretty close to my hometown um, and visit there quite often, um, that was that was critical. I, I felt like I needed to um, do the best that I could to make an impact on the world and being outside of, outside of the North um, wasn't how I could do that. So um, the connection to land and, and community has, has been absolutely critical. And for me, one of the silver linings of COVID um, is that it's kept me um, home in the North uh, since March and uh, allowed me a lot more time to, you know, go out to my cabin and spend time on the land and, and really connect, um, spend time with my child and all those kinds of things, which, um, in some ways, I think has been a bit of a renewal um, in in uh, in these busy these busy times. So um, I'm actually, in some ways, kind of grateful um, the unintended consequences of COVID. Well, thank you, Candice. I I'm actually thinking about as you speak that I miss fishing tremendously. And being out in the lake outside Yellowknife fishing with a good friend of mine up there like that, that was that was a, one of the top experiences of my life, being out there in the land. Northwest Territories I'm not all that familiar with. I'm obviously from Tacker River, closer to Whitehorse. But can I move on to my next question? You have all achieved some singularly great things in the world, uh, received awards, from Inspire to Arctic Inspiration to awards for teaching. But I'm wondering as you look back, and, and hindsight is always so difficult, isn't it? If we can do it with some gentleness, if we were to look back and think, you know, what would have really helped you in your journey? Is there a way that policymakers at any level could have been more helpful? Were there, are there areas that you look forward to? You think, you know what, this is what Canada needs to do either at a regional or territorial, provincial level or federally to support the types of innovation that you've led. Uh, so Scott, I'm, I'm gonna turn to you if you don't mind. I'm just gonna flip it around a little bit. Sure. What do you think um, would have been more helpful for you if there anything from policy in the past, policymakers or looking forward, what do you think needs to happen? 
Yeah, I might actually look more forward on this, Rose. Um, we've been incredibly fortunate with uh, to be the beneficiaries of what I think is some excellent policy planning at the local level here in Yukon. Um, so I, I have very, very little to uh, to dissect and, and be critical about that about on the local level. Um, but with, with the bigger picture, you know, I, I was giving this a little bit of thought and um, you know, policy uh, as with innovation is is relatively new to me. Um, but something that I think going forward at the really big level is going to be critical is uh, continuing to recognize the role that innovation plays in imp improving social markers. So something that all three of us have in common is that we're social innovators. And often, I think when uh, when when terms around innovation are um, are discussed, it's often thought to be technology or um, or or inventions or mechanical uh, innovation. And uh, the social innovation space is incredibly powerful, and it is growing rapidly. Uh, there are a lot of um, a lot of incredible concepts coming out. And and for me, what innovation means for me is connecting things that aren't intuitively connected to uh, to unlock magic, really. And I have a science background, so to talk about magic is a is a departure for me, but I really feel that that innovation, whether you're connecting people or ideas or physical things, um, to open up this whole new realm of possibility. That's that's what innovation is for me, and that's what I see in action with the innovative thinkers around me. Um, you know, connected stationary bikes in classrooms with with games, with data. I mean, they, these are all things that intuitively don't kind of fit together, but um, you know, we're making that work. And so, I think recognizing the potential for innovation in the social sector to move some of these social markers is 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 really really critical for policymakers to think about the kind of work that that we're doing right so we're a tech startup but we're a social enterprise and and um we're kind of in that growing area where uh where where you can do both um and so um i, I think policy can also support overcoming regional challenges like for us uh proximity to capital markets patient capital markets we're uh we've been the beneficiaries of of some grants to help with our product development um but we need uh, we need investment capital to to really uh, structure our growth and get us to the next level and scale and that was more challenging before covid and, it, and interestingly enough those conversations are easier to have uh, now, because everyone's doing things remotely, so not sure if that's going to persist or not. But, um, but I think that that's uh, that those those are a couple of things that that policymakers can consider going forward. And UConn's been doing a great job. They've got an innovation plan that they're developing right now, so they've been soliciting a lot of this feedback. And I've been I've been vocal about that. Great work, Scott. Lois, can I turn to you next? If is are there things that you see that policymakers can do either regionally, community, or provincial, territorial to support the work of innovation like you've done? Is, is there anything that comes to mind for you, Lois? Yeah, there are. Um, for me, I, I think we're in a really unique time in terms of innovation, reconciliation, um, all of those those buzzwords and and I was on a Zoom call last week with um, the Trans Canada Trail looking at looking at what some of our mandates are with the Trans Canada Trail and and there was a speaker on on the phone that was talking about reconciliation and the whole concept of reconciliation is such a huge huge concept. And he broke it down into five different areas of, of reconciliation, whether it's legal reconciliation, spiritual, cultural, political, or economic. And, and for me, the innovative piece of that is now it allows us to name our targets, um, with, especially within an Indigenous community perspective. Um, we are so disadvantaged in so many areas, but yet we are so rich in a sense of who we are. And and if we can just begin to 
some of our challenges through that frame and lens, um, I think that it really lends to the idea that innovative practices are there and, and we just need to figure out how to move them. Thank you, Lois. Candice, I suspect that you might have seen some links in the work that you've done in evaluation based on Indigenous knowledges. Anything you'd like to add around what policymakers um, might want to consider to support the social innovation that the three of you have been leading on? What what would what would support it even further from your perspective? Um, I think um, the the belief in big ideas, um, you know, supporting risk capital. Um, one of the 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 greatest things that came for us from the Arctic Inspiration Prize and earning that entire million dollars um, was that they gave a million dollars, a single check, a million dollars to uh, a 28 year old and uh, who didn't even have an organization yet um, and said, off you go, do great things. And that's what we did. Um, and we, you know, the belief in us that they, that we could try we could try many things and see what worked and, um, you know, throw out what didn't. Um, not having a lot of barriers um, around the funding that we received initially to really kick off um, Smash and to really expand Foxy, um, that really led to explosive growth for us and um, a lot of success. So um, I would love to see policymakers support more um, big ideas like that and um, to have belief in, in our Northerners um, going forward. I'd like to, to come back to you, Candice, with a, with a final question, just to start with you, because Candice, you have kind of touched on something which I find quite remarkable. All three of you have touched on in different ways. And it's that you, you've either seen something that needed to be changed or wanted to do something more for community. And there's something different about change makers that sometimes gives us hope. And I'm wondering, Candace, my question to all of you will be, and I'm going to start with Candace, is what, what is the thing that gives you hope, that gives you that ability to look at the world and say, you know what, we can change this. When other people might have said, oh, I can't do it, status quo, keep it. But you actually said, no, we're going to change it. And Candace, is there is there one thing you would say, you know, that's what really helped me get that or one or two things that helped you to have that vision? Um, I think for me, it's, um, you know, continuing to interact with a lot of the participants who've, who've been through our programming in the last eight years and, you know, having them randomly come back to me and, uh, you know, tell me how they're in university or um, how they're they're doing well and um, how the things that they learned through Foxy and Smash have changed their lives. Um, to me, that's, um, I mean, it's the, it's the reason that we, we do the work that we do here and um, it's very personally meaningful. Thank you for that, Candace. Scott, can I, can I turn to you next? What, what has been the thing that has given you hope to look at systems and structures that don't work and, and for you to just stand up and say, you know what, let's change that. What, what gives you that hope? Well, that hope, like I touched on previously, is a lot of that is provided by my business partner who's just a super inspiring dude and, and uh, you know, has been, um, you know, per perpetually hopeful in the face of every challenge that uh, that, that he's ever faced. And um, so, you know, in some respect, I'm riding on his coattails, but that has that has brought my own uh, hope in, and I see I see hope all around me in coming back to a theme, this theme of community and place, and to see the the in, the intention uh, from policy and government and and innovative thinkers to to create a place and the infrastructure to support people to to be hopeful. Because really, that's what we're doing as innovators is is being hopeful and trying new things. Um, so to have the community in place and the right people around us, um, I see when I'm here every day, I see amazing things happening around me that I never would have connected or or thought of. And we see a lot of 
the benefit of that in the in in the programming around us. And so uh, everything around me gives gives me hope right now. Something else that gives me hope that I'll that I'll talk about is just touch on um, the the place that I think the North can play, Northern Canada in particular can play as as our relationship and our border and our trade with our traditional trading partners to the south continues to be complicated. Uh, Northern Canada is now really at the intersection of a market of two billion people in uh, in Asia and Europe and Russia. And I really think there's an incredible opportunity for policymakers in Southern Canada to look north as a geographical center for really a new world and a new world Order. Did I just say that? Um, but uh, but I really I really feel like we're on the frontier, and uh, and and we can be at the center of um, of of global leadership uh, geographically and um, and in thought for a lot of amazing hopeful ideas going forward. Thank you, Scott, and for flipping the map. I'm sure anyone all across the north would appreciate that. Center of Canada really is the north. Mm -hmm. Lois, can I can I turn to you? You have done some amazing work in leading change in individuals and students that have that you've supported. What is the one thing that has given you hope through through all of this to keep trying to change structures for kids? I think what has given me the most hope is the expectation of my community, um, the expectation that, that I can be and need to be a voice where sometimes there is no voice. Um, I think, as I said earlier, having grown up in that space between the Indigenous and the non-Indigenous cultures has really allowed me to, to understand that really hope needs to be based in a connection between community um, and I think with the pandemic it's given us a unique opportunity to, to look inward at about who we are as as the NWT um, and and I look say to Yellowknife and some of the some of the things that are happening in and around social development and it makes me hopeful that the conversations what do we really need to create systemic change for our most vulnerable populations? Um, and that's where I get my hope that that we are having those conversations and that we are we are looking at in innovative changes around government policy that we haven't seen before. Wow, thank you, Lois. I, I, you've given us so much to think about for the three of you. Thank you, Lois. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Candace. Not only for giving us your time and thoughts and wisdom today, but also around the change that you're leading in your communities and you're leading in the North. Yolanda, I think we have a lot of material here. Um, I'd like to just share from the themes that I'm going to talk, walk away from are so focused on people. And in fact, the, they, they are measuring their success on the changes and, and the capacity and the development they see in the people around them. I'm also struck by, and this is not going to be new, but I continue to be struck by the fact that innovators and leaders, when the rest of us might see challenge, they see opportunity. I think it's an opportunity for us then to think about the challenges in our lives and how do we actually look at it from just a slightly different perspective. And maybe it is from the perspective of the land. Maybe it is reconnecting with our communities, and maybe that's a perspective that gives us the strength to take on crisis and change it into opportunity. So Yolanda, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm gonna hand this back to you um, to wrap this up, and thank you to Public Policy Forum and to all your staff. Particularly, I hold up my hands to Lois, Scott, and Candace. Amazing work. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, thank you so much. I couldn't have said it. Uh better myself. Um, you all of you have been such an inspiration um, to the country um, as to how we can do more, be better, uh, be connected. Hello, can you see me? Well, I think there was a little bit of a, an issue there. Um, so thank you so much for just giving of your time and really inspiring us, as I've said. So Rose to you, thank you, Lois, Scott, 
um, Candice, I do want to take a moment to also thank our, inter our presenters, uh, Bill Mintram from the um, Rideau Hall Foundation, Stephen Mills from the Yukon government, and Kyla Kakli-Scott from the Government of the Northwest Territories. And to our partners, because um, yes, uh, PPF, it, it, we're so happy to be able to host these summits and these sessions, and today's session would not have been possible at all without the government of Northwest Territories, without the government of Yukon, the government of Canada, the Rideau Hall Foundation and the McDonald Foundation. So thank you so much. And of course, uh, we want to give a special th shout out as well. And thank you for our partner, Bespoke AV, for their work on the production side of this event as well. So um, our next session um, is scheduled for next Monday, November 16th from 2 to 3 o'clock. Um, and it'll be on Canada-U.S. relations. Of course, after the presidential election, we'll have the opportunity to hear from Canada's ambassador for the U.S., Her Excellency, Ms. Kirsten Hillman. So um, if you want more, that's the good news before we, though, you have an opportunity to connect. And I and I do hope that you do take advantage of this privilege um, to, to, to say hello to Scott, to Candice, and, and to Lois and their teams, as well as several other great innovators. You can go to the virtual exhibit hall happening now on Feedlip. Just click over to exhibit hall tab on the left-hand side. I'm not going to try to point it on the screen because I'll get it wrong as you see it. Um, of your screen and stop by their virtual exhibit booths. It's a great way to keep this conversation, this so very important conversation going. So thank you, merci beaucoup, and I wish you all a wonderful rest of the day.